Uh, hello everyone and thanks for coming to the symposium. I am Laura Mindra and my presentation will be about what Hatsa can tell us about the existent verbal number terminology. So the two key concepts here are Hatsa and verbal number. Let's start with a brief introduction of the Hatsa language and the Hatsa people. As Alba already mentioned, Hatsa is an isolate spoken in north central Tanzania. Its speaker number uh, varies to quite an extent from 1,000 to over 6,000 speakers. The language status is indicated as threatened. Uh, the Hadza people are some of the last people on earth hunting and gathering their food. Apart from this, they do forage, uh, they buy and trade. For part of the year, they live in semi-permanent camps in Mongolia. For income, they are dependent on jobs uh, uh, as guards or on farms and on tourism. The Hadza people work with the so-called uh, system of immediate return, which means that hunted and gathered food is shared within the community on the same day or shortly after. And then we move on to verbal number. Uh, first, it is good to start with an explanation of what verbal number exactly is and some typological information. A verbal number is commonly defined as number associated with events. You indicate that an action finds place multiple times or the people involved in this action are plural. An important characteristic of verbal number is that it needs to have its formal marking on the verb. Cross-linguistically, there are three ways that occur most to express verbal number. A fixed morphology, a replication of the verb stem or a part of this verb stem, or the use of two separate verb forms for the singular and the plural. So, um, an example of a fixed morphology comes from Barasano, which is a Tucanoan language spoken in Colombia. Uh, it says the next day they went from place to place chopping down posts. In example one, the suffix kudi that you can see over here indicates that it is chopped at multiple places, which means uh, multiple times. For this end, prefixes and suffixes um, uh, and infixes occur in all macro areas of the world. However, uh, prefixes and infixes are less widespread than suffixes. Prefixes and infixes occur in Papuanesia, Australia, and in some North American and African languages. An example of reduplication comes from Rotuman, which is an Austronesian language spoken in Fiji. In example three, a part of the verb root alome come is reduplicated before the root itself, as you can see um, over here, um, to indicate a repetition of the action. To come becomes to come repeatedly. Even though affixation is the most frequently used strategy, reduplication is the most widespread one. That is because reduplication is an iconic strategy. A repetition of the form means a repetition of the event. Partial reduplication is the most common form as opposed to full reduplication. Finally, an example of the use of two different verb forms verb forms comes from uh, Huichol, which is a uto aztecan language spoken in West Central Mexico. In examples four and five, uh, two different verbal roots are used. In four, there is um, which indicates that a singular object is killed, so the chicken. And in five, there is which indicates that a plural uh, object is killed, so the chickens. Uh, this use of two different verb forms is most widespread in native North American languages, although it occurs in all geographic areas. However, apart from these three, uh, one can also find other strategies, such as auxiliaries and internal modification of the verb stem. In Africa, so where Hatsa is spoken, uh, suffixation and reduplication occur most. So now you have heard the necessary things about the formal features, we move on to the next part, the semantics of verbal number. I have to make a short note here. Um, the paper I'm writing is not specifically aimed at this part, but focuses as well on the question, 
whether Hatsa follows the typology regarding the list linguistic expression of verbal number. But I wanted to make the semantics the focus of what I want to tell you today, as Hatsa offers some um, very good examples that got me thinking. Um, the problem with this within the field of verbal number is the lack of consensus among researchers about the terminology. There is, however, one distinction that seems to be fairly widespread and is often used by researchers, for example, by uh, Corbett in his book Number. This is also the terminology I first heard of um, when learning about verbal number in class. This distinction is between two main types of verbal number, event number and participant number. In short, event number indicates that the action described by the predicate finds place several times, and participant number indicates that multiple participants are involved in this action. And then it is often presented like, um, well, this is event number, see an example. So the following fragment that you can see over here um, comes from uh, Corbett. Um, and basically it says uh, event number can be illustrated from Hausa and then an example of uh, event number. So at first, this inspired me to do such a same small investigation for Hatsa aimed at two research questions. In what ways can verbal number be linguistically expressed? And is this method used to express event number or participant number? But that's where Hatsa shows us how language really works. Uh, while writing, I figured out it was by far not that straightforward to make a distinction between event number and participant number. Before discussing some examples of this, um, it is first important to tell you something about the way in which the data were collected. Um, Hatsa has still been very under-researched and verbal number is definitely an under-researched area for Hatsa. The data I present to you here were mostly collected by Kirk Miller. However, uh, Miller collected these data with the goal to make a lexicon instead of a morphosyntactic investigation and it has not come to real morphosyntactic tests yet. The translations provided are therefore a more rough translations. Very quickly, the formal ways in which um, verbal number can be expressed in Hatsa uh, and are available in the literature um, are the prefix, prefix uh, H vowel, the infix K vowel, the suffix ma, uh, the suffix he, which is the habitual, um, yeah, not that. <laughs> and the capital V here stands for the first uh, vowel of the verb root. Uh, the verb root itself can also be fully reduplicated, and the affixes uh, K, vowel, and he can also be reduplicated to strengthen the multiplicity. So um, let me now show you some examples. Firstly, we have this pair of examples. In six, we have the verb kupu, which means crush. And the meaning of it is that a single subject is crushing. In seven, um, there is a prefix a hu before the verb. Um, and then it means that a plural subject is crushing. Okay, fine, a plural subject. So we have to do with the plurality of the participants, which means participant number. This might be your first thought, but think about it. If multiple people are crushing, it automatically means that the event of crushing is taking place multiple times. So what is it, event number or participant number? And next example, uh, in eight, you have the verb xake, meaning shoot. And here it is translated as shoot an arrow. Uh, if you put the prefix ha in front of this verb, as in uh, number nine, the meaning becomes a hit with a shower of arrows. So what can you make out of this? Well, I found three possible interpretations. Interpretation one, uh, I hope you can read this because um, you are all in, okay, <laughs> great. Uh, one person shoots multiple times sequentially as in the following fragments. Okay, I think um, it's clear now. 
uh, you can surely describe this action as hitting with a shower of arrows. So this means the event of shooting takes place multiple times, which is event number. But okay. Interpretation two, multiple people are shooting their arrow at once, such as in the following fragments. Their prowess was brought about by a culture of constant practice. English archers at Cressy would have practiced just like this. So here we have a plurality of the subject involved here. So you might think this is participant number. But as you could also see in the fragment, the fact that multiple people are shooting automatically implies that the event of shooting itself is taking place multiple times. So what is it, participant or event number? Interpretation three, it might even be possible that one person has three arrows on his bow and shoots with these three arrows at once. It seems some kind of unrealistic film action, but it is possible, I looked it up, and you can see it over here. And well, the Hadza people are hunter-gatherers, so you might assume they know how to use a bow. In this case, it becomes very interesting because there's one person and one event, but what is plural then? The instrument? But yes, you can also perform this action multiple times and it can also be carried out by several persons. Maybe this specific instance is a consequence of the lack of concrete information about Hadza, but for how it is presented here, the interpretation can go in many different directions. A last example. Um, here it is made use of the suffix uh, ma over here. And the meaning of it um, is to carry a huge load of tubers. Uh, well, according to Miller, um, this sentence can have two interpretations. Interpretation one is that multiple loads are being carried. In this sense, you would think of participant number with a plural object. However, could this also mean that the event of carrying has to be performed multiple times in order to transfer all loads from A to B? Could it also be event number then? Interpretation two, multiple people are carrying. In this sense, it is participant number with a plural subject. Well, here there's something interesting going on. There is a contrast uh, between this example and the example of the shooting with the arrows. Although the fact that multiple people are shooting automatically implies that the shooting itself happens several times, as I showed, this is not the case for this load carrying example. It is perfectly fine if multiple people together hold that load of tubers. Imagine they put them in a cart and together they push that cart. That way, the whole event of carrying only has to be performed once. So what does Hatsa show us? At first, the search for a category to put these example sentences in, uh, either event or participant number, almost caused me to make analyses way too bluntly. When multiple people are crushing, this is a plurality of the subject and thus participant number. Only at the last minute, I realized that uh, often the one implies the other. Of course, that is particularly something for me to learn from, but I also think it is very important to take into account that such strict divisions often do not render justice to the true inherent meanings of a sentence. I understand that the research field of linguistics um, benefits from clear terminology, and I don't want to say that terminology in general is not useful for verbal number, but maybe this terminology is not the best since it might be too categorical. These findings are in line with Arka and uh, Dalrymple, who state that uh, depending on, amongst others, the semantics of the verb and the animacy of the participants, it is possible to interpret something as both uh, multiple participants and multiple events. When searching the literature a bit more, I did in fact uh, find another way in which verbal number can be defined, given by Machiola. 
she makes a three-way instead of a two-way distinction. Uh, plurectionality stricto sensu, spatial distributivity, and participant plurality. The strengths, in my opinion, are in how these terms are defined, uh, laying more emphasis on the overlap between the categories. So let me explain how she defines these terms. Plurectionality stricto sensu means that single occurrences are distributed over time so that the event uh, occurs, in multiple occurs multiple times. Spatial distributivity means that a situation occurs in multiple places. Automatically, then, this event takes place multiple times. Participant plurality is explained as follows. When the situation takes place multiple times, um, the entities involved are also plural. For example, if the event of killing is plural, um, consequently, more than one entity will have to be killed because you can't kill an entity twice. Machiola emphasizes here that participant plurality often appears together with spatial distributivity. When an event is carried out in different places, it is likely to involve multiple participants. In conclusion, I wanted to make you familiar with the problem within linguistics regarding verbal number, the terminology. There is no consensus yet um, regarding the terminology. And although a distinction between event number and participant number is often made, Hatsa shows us that if one wants to hold tight to this distinction too much, you might get in trouble since you can often interpret a sentence as both participant and event number. It is important to keep reflecting on terminology in order to find one that a consensus can be reached about. And most importantly, keeping in mind that terminology is not the same as pigeonholing. There should always be room for continua and fluctuation. Otherwise, one might overlook the details that make language so interesting. So uh, that's it. So do you have any questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Laura, I, uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, if you can stop your screen share and bring us back to the grid here. Yes, I see that uh, Bonnie once again has her hand up. Yes. Uh, I, I apologize for always asking a question first, but I did work on this language. So I always have a lot of uh, uh, opinions and thoughts. Uh, thanks so much for this. You know, you really show how it, important semantic fieldwork is and both Kirk Miller and I were really more phonology phonetician side of people and not so much or Kirk is more morphosyntax than I am but not so much semantic fieldwork which I think you're showing that we really need to do you know not everybody goes out and say look at this guy shooting two arrows at once <laughs> that's kind of the kind of questions you have to ask to tease these things apart so uh, one comment is Hadza does have a pleurotional marker and so that fits in really well with Mattiola's typology. So I think you ought to look at Hadza pleuractional marker. And in fact, I remember the Hadza pleuractional marker, despite my fieldwork having been 30 years ago, I don't remember the ha and the ma. So I don't feel like they were as frequent. And Hadza does have so much number marking, you know, and, uh, and animacy plays a role in um, word order and number marking as well. So I think the cases where you would need to semantic mark these some of these semantic distinctions are maybe not so frequent because a lot of it can come about in other ways. So I, please look at these markers in a broader context, I guess is what I'm saying. Do more work is what we're always saying. Yeah, yeah, and go to Tanzania and do field work, please. It would be great. More research is always needed, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. I think that that's actually a really good point, Bonnie, um, given how um, how sort of uh, frequently we encounter number marking uh, and, and, and what a role it plays. Yeah, I think that that's, that that's a really good point. Um, Martin, your, your hand is up. And I better say something. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, I'm very happy with uh, your, the main point of your, of your presentation that uh, uh, it, uh, that, yeah, to, in, to understand what um, what the exact meaning is of, of correctional it doesn't help to come up with um, definitions of of uh, you know 
of something that is outside of language. We really have to go from the form to see, okay, what does it mean? And I think it's uh, a correctional morpheme will in most languages uh, mean the whole, the whole array of things, indeed, depending on, on what, uh, what the semantics of the, of, of, of the verb itself is, and that you show very clearly. I think you, um, I worked on console uh, plurectionals, which is Cushitic and very much outside of this uh, Rift Valley area. Um, but there we did it together with Ongai, a native speaker, which was crucial to find, you know, the fine grain differences in, in, in the semantics. <clears throat> and um, we also came to a kind of semantic uh, uh, subclassification, as you have that in, in uh, aspectual classes or actions art. I think you need something like that for verbal number two, like things that you can only do once or things that that you will automatically do many times and, and, and all of that. But looking at that into the semantics, um, the challenge will, will come for, for Hadza. It's not only Hadza, it's the same problem that we have in, in, in West Cliff South Cushitic, is that um, the, uh, the challenge is that it is not just one morpheme marking correctionality, and then it's very easy to get uh, confused because there are also uh, morphemes that mark iterative or habitual and all sorts of that. So it is at both sides, at the formal side and at the semantic side, it's very different, difficult to, to tease the two, the two apart. So uh, I would I would go first with with one marker and see how you get with the semantics and then with another and then and then then decide within the same singular lexeme if you have uh, various forms that are in the area of, of number in the verb whether they have actually when you, you can see whether they have actually different meanings and I know it will be practically impossible with the data that you have but I like the, the general jest that uh, indeed, actually for console, we could show that it's even beyond event number, that um, that's what all the uh, theoretical papers on directional will say is that it is within one event. Uh, what we find is that's usually the case, but it doesn't necessarily has to be the case. You can use a directional to sleep, to sleep at different places, which is not at the same time. Thank you. You definitely raised some um, interesting notes to make in the paper or to uh, take in mind uh, when doing further investigation. Yes. Um, my mind immediately goes to, um, yeah, in terms of in terms of the context of this paper, I mean, are there are there tests or are there ways that you can sort of get at some of these distinctions anymore, or are you know, is that sort of moot? Is that until until we go and 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 do more field work? Yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah, that's something to think about. Yeah. Mm. Maybe someone else has a suggestion. Uh, I see that Jeremy Coburn has his hand up. Jeremy, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for this talk. This was very interesting. Um, at, at just as Bonnie and Kirk, I also am on the phonetics phonology side of things. So thinking about the semantics is not something that I re regularly do. And it does definitely show the, the need for this type of work because as a phonologist, you might go in and, and collect a lot of data and you think you've, you've understood the context of what it means and really you just you, you don't pay attention to the fine grained semantic differences between specific things. So I, 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 I echo Bonnie's uh, request that you, you continue to run with this or the importance of uh, semantic fieldwork. Um, one question that I did have and, and kind of a response to, to Andrew's uh, question or, or thought is that um, 
have you considered looking at like some of the naturalistic data or some of the data that uh, is becoming available through ELAR to be able to look at the occurrences of these things and seeing you know how regular they are how common they are um, obviously the data is still in a in a uh, unprocessed form largely um, but i think that would be interesting because the reason why i say that is anytime you have a, a phonologist or a morphosyntactician working on a language and they're putting together a lexicon you always have to take uh, you know glosses or, or definitions with a grain of salt and you know realize that maybe what he thinks is a pluractional marker is actually something else, as Martin mentioned. Um, and so I think that it's important to start to look at if you can find data without, with while well, either traveling to Tanzania to go do the research or potentially using the, the data, because I'm very aware of how difficult it is to go, get to Tanzania to do the, the field work. Um, but I think that would be a way that you could start to tease some of these things apart. Yeah, thank you for your suggestion. I'll look it up. And Jenny uh, has her hand up. Feel, feel free to go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Laura. I really liked your talk. Thank you uh, for it. I, I really like the way you, you presented it and, and also the point you made. Um, uh, Katja Sochkova wrote a dissertation on Hausa pluractionals, and she did a lot of semantic field work for that. And one of the things that she ran into was that there's so, many, so much variation, especially what type of specific meanings people would allow or not allow. And also that for certain, certain participant numbers, you, number cases, you didn't only need um, uh, uh, you, it, it, only participant number wouldn't be enough, but you also would need something like uh, many or um, or at various locations or something that they're really special, special plural kind of uh, interpretation. So I was wondering whether you ran into anything of that kind as well. Um, yeah, well, um, thank you. Could you maybe provide me uh, that reference about the Hatsa? I, I will, uh, I will, uh, it's not about Hatsa. Uh, uh, Hatsa. <laughs> I will give you a book because I have a spare copy. I will give it on Thursday. Okay, thank you. Ah, oh, fantastic. Uh, 